What do you call a story that doesn't have a good ending? There's a name for that. You think about in media, in film, in art, in literature, uh, sometimes I, I, in sports. Uh, I'm a huge sports fan, and I, I have suffered a lot because I'm from Chicago, and I like the Chicago teams, so I'm a Cubs fan and a Bears fan, and I've suffered a lot. A lot of times, this is going to be our season, and the season starts well and doesn't end well. So we have that idea. The, the, the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, had a particular word to describe a story that had an unfortunate or an unsatisfactory ending. Uh, and it came from two words. One of those words was ode, which means song, and you probably know that an ode is a song. And the other was tragos, which means goat. And when you put those two words together, you would get uh, tragoidia, which means goat song. The word tragoidia is where we get our word what? Tragedy. Tragedy. That's, it means the song of the goat. And I say that because at the end of Acts chapter 7, it sure feels like this has been a tragedy. Stephen has, has been murdered. And as he was murdered for preaching the gospel, for preaching truth, for preaching Christ, and it sure feels like evil has won at this point. We, we look at the, the end of Acts 7, and it's very reasonable in a human mind to think, hey God, why didn't you step in? Why didn't you protect Stephen? Why, I, I, what, what's going on here? And this idea of evil is on full display at the end of Acts 7, and it's already been on display in Acts. And we are taking an excursus this morning, taking some time to talk about evil. At the end of Acts 7, this tragedy. Why is it a tragedy? Because it seems like evil won. And that's an important thing for us to wrap our minds and our hearts around. Don't you feel sometime like evil wins? It sure seems that way here in Acts and in, and in the Bible. I mean, as, as we will go through Acts, we will see men and women of God who are persecuted, who are martyred. We see this in the Old and the New Testaments. There's a lot of tragedy because there's a lot of evil, and we have seen evil. Let's look at Acts chapter 6, just to recap a little bit. Uh, I want you to look at verse 10, please. Acts chapter 6, verse 10. This is the setup for the story of Stephen. It says, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. It's a powerful statement, friends. He knew God so well, he knew he had such wisdom through the Holy Spirit that they had nothing to say. They couldn't uh, uh, trip him up in his own words. So what it says is, they secretly instigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They lied about him, they set him up. And they stirred up the people. You talk about misinformation and disinformation. They stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and they, come, and they came upon him and they grabbed him and they seized him. That's forcefully. And they brought him before the council. It's a total setup. So he's before the council and he is going to preach the gospel. That's what happens at the start of Acts chapter 7. If you will, in Acts 7, go towards the end. I want you to look at Acts chapter 7, verse 54. So Stephen has preached the gospel. He shared the good news. Yes, he's told them of their sin, but he didn't leave it there. He said there's hope in Jesus. There's redemption in Jesus. He said, yes, this Jesus who you killed, that was bad, that was evil, but he will forgive you. Stephen just didn't tell them the bad. He told them the good. But they were so enraged by him. Verse 54, it says, Now when they heard these things, they were enraged. And they, they ground their teeth. Verse 58. Then they cast him out of the city, and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. It sure seems like evil had won. Do you think when you read this, any of you thought, I wonder what happened to his wife? I wonder what happened to his kids? How were they provided for? Did anyone here that was responsible for this, did they get justice? 
Did, did the people who lied and set this whole thing up and then encouraged it, did they ever come to justice? What about his parents? He probably wasn't an old, he's probably a younger guy. And we see here the first martyr of thousands to come that would be killed for preaching Jesus. Also, and this will be next week, we have already seen in Acts the wrath of God on display. And that's its own thing. And next week, we'll take a second rabbit trail, a second excursion, to talk about the wrath of God. The holy, righteous, just wrath of God. And as we finish up these first seven chapters of Acts, we'll take two weeks, this excursus. The idea of an excursus, we get the word excursion from it. And I do like a good rabbit trail. Um, I really enjoy a good rabbit trail. And so the idea of an excursus is to stop and to really take a point that's being made and drill down on that. And that's what we're going to do here. And so when it comes to evil, we've got to get this idea of evil right. Uh, The prophet Isaiah would write in, in chapter 5, verse 20, Isaiah says, Woe to those who call evil good and who call good evil who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And at the beginning, anytime we talk about evil, and we're going to begin to talk about the nature and the attributes of God, we have to set the tone for our human minds. When we try to think and wrap these minds around who God is, that is largely an impossible task. It is an impossible task for the mind that does not have the Holy Spirit. We as believers have the Holy Spirit, so we do have a new nature, and we do have some insight there, but we're still in this in-between, already-not-yet phase. But I want to say here to set the tone, God owes us no apology or explanation for who He is, what He does, and how He does it. Amen? He doesn't owe us an explanation. Now, He reveals much of his heart and much of his mind and his will in Scripture. Praise his name to his glory. But we have to understand that it's God's prerogative to do as he wills and as he wishes. Our job is not to apologize for God. Especially God as he reveals his actions in Scripture. In Psalm 115, Psalm 115.3, our God is in the heaven and he does whatever he pleases. Amen? That's his prerogative and his right to do what he wants. And we understand that God is not like us. We may have been made in his image, yes, but we aren't God. He is omnipotent, all-powerful. He is omniscient. He's all-knowing. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere at all times. We have a broken sin nature. He does not. So, of course, we would question his right to do what he wants to do with what he has made. I do think it's ironic when we see the world that rejects him, that doesn't know him, when uh, they, they take this God they don't even believe in, and they hold this imaginary God to a standard that they themselves don't even uphold. I don't like that God. Well, God knew the depths of the human heart in both the Old and the New Testament. I want you to look at two passages here that just speak of God's right to be God. The first one is Jeremiah 18, 1-6. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. And the vessel, this lump of clay that he was working with, this potter, the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled, it was ruined in the potter's hand. And he reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter, not the clay. The clay didn't say, hey, I don't like what you're doing with me now. Right? I wanted to be a coffee mug, not an ashtray. <laughs> you know? that, that's not the clay's right to do so. The potter gets to choose what is done with the clay. Verse 5, then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, and so are we. In the New Testament, in the book of Romans, in the middle, middle of a very deep theological passage on God's sovereign will and God's sovereign right. 
In Romans chapters 8, 9, and 10 are some, 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 some wonderful uh, scripture there, very good and deep, and, and if you embrace what's being taught, it's beautiful. A lot of people fight against it. But in the middle of that, God anticipates a, a, not just a response in the human heart, but he anticipates a, a visceral response in the human heart to what Paul has just written. So in the middle of God telling us his right, here's what it says in Romans chapter 9, verse 14 and 15. What should we say then? Is there injustice with God? Absolutely not. For he, uh, for he tells Moses, I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Verse 18 says, so then he has mercy <clears throat> on whom he wants to have mercy, and he, has, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. And then verses 20 through 24. On the contrary, who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Now the funny thing is, is how many of us will admit we've talked back to God. My hands, me both hands, right? I, I, yes, God, why? God, what? God, come on now. I, all, more than I, I even probably realized. So he is very kind and gracious and slow to anger with us, his creation. But on the contrary, it says, why did you, you know, who are we to talk back to God? Will what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Or has the potter no right over the clay to make from the same lump of clay one piece of pottery for honor and one for dishonor? And what if God, wanting to display his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience, with much patience objects of wrath prepared for destruction? And what if he did this to make known the riches of his glory on objects of mercy? that he prepared beforehand for glory on us, the ones he also called. Not only from the Jews, but also, yea, us, the Gentiles. So with all that being said, I just want to set the tone of, I'm going to do my best to basically make a defense for God, but y'all, God does not need me to make a defense for him. No one can accuse God of being uh, of being bad because there's such a thing as evil. So let's ask this question. What is evil? What is evil? And here's the thing, folks. At least we as believers, we have a quantifiable definition of what evil is because we know what good is. That's such an important concept this morning to get. Biblically speaking, evil is that which is opposite to the nature, the character, and the will of God. I'll say it again. Biblically speaking, evil is that which is opposite to the nature, character, and will of God. It is the distortion of what is good. Now, there's two types of evil, and I want you to write this down. Hopefully you've got a journal, you're taking notes. Two types of evil. There's natural evil, and there's personal or human evil. There's natural evil, and there's personal or human evil. Every human being who lives experiences both of these kinds of evil. We, we, we experience it. Okay, we, we understand the idea of natural evil. There are hurricanes, and there are tornadoes, and there are tsunamis, and there are earthquakes, and there are volcanic eruptions, and there are, I mean, there, there, are, there are things, of, because nature itself is, even nature is under the curse. Romans and, and, and the Bible speaks of how nature groans because of the curse of sin. So there is this natural evil which befells man. But then there is, uh, uh, there, and, and even with the natural evil, even we feel that in our own bodies. There are things that happen to our bodies like uh, a torn retina. Or a cataract. Or your gallbladder goes bad on you, and all of a sudden has to be taken out. Or uh, you're born with a leaky heart valve. All things that have happened to me. <laughs> People get brain cancer. People, the, we, we, we feel in these, in these bodies the weight of the natural evil. Cancer, that's a natural evil. But then there is personal, there is human evil. And, and, and that's addressed in God's moral law. 
But we see and we hear and we feel it all the time. Murder, rape, theft, lying, corruption, abuse. The amount of pain and suffering caused by human evil, honestly, is incomprehensible. It shadows the amount of natural evil that takes place. And everybody is subject to both kinds. And in some ways, evil, it's like cancer. Okay? If you can't, uh, there's a body, a body can have cancer, but cancer does not exist without a body. Does that make sense? So just like good can exist without evil, but evil cannot exist without good because it's the antithesis. It's, it's good that is corrupted. Um, I grew up in the Midwest, grew up outside of Chicago, and they would put salt on the roads, and you could have a three-year-old car that would have rust on it. You don't have to worry about that out here near as much. But uh, in, in a sense, rust is corrosion. It is distortion of that car. You, can't, you can take the rust out of the car, but you can't take the car out of the rust. So you can have evil, right? Evil exists because of good. So this idea here of, of, of evil. And why does evil exist? That's our next thought here. Why does evil exist? Or where does it come from? That is a challenge. That question for all worldviews. I don't care where, you, where anybody in this world lands explaining where evil came from and why it exists. That's a challenge for everybody. But I am, for simplicity's sake, I'm going to boil it down to just kind of three worldviews and what they look at regarding evil. So the first worldview is the mind that says there is no God. So the mind that says there is no God, um, or there's no external spiritual force, for them, everything is only natural. And because everything evolves, and it's the idea of survival of the fittest, no matter, in other words, you, the biggest uh, predominant factor outside of God for, for nature is just to survive. So there is no standard of evil because there's no standard of what? Good. There's no purpose. There's no higher meaning. You live, you die, that's it. There's no cause to life. There is no justice. We just are. We just exist. So evil becomes malleable. It becomes what man says it is because man is the standard. And here's what's dangerous, friends. When man becomes the standard, that's why in the last century, in the 20th century, that is why more than 100 million people died at the hand of human government. Do you realize that? Look, when humanism rules, evil reigns. When humanism rules, evil reigns. There is no utopia, my friends. The idea that man can create utopia, that comes from the idea that man himself is the greatest being. And that anything that gets in the way of that needs to be eliminated. So there's the mind that says there is no God, and there is no definition of evil because there is no standard of good. Then there's a second category, which is a spiritual mind, a religious mind outside of the truth of Scripture. In other words, evil, and you see this a lot <clears throat> with, with, with a lot of religion, evil is the non-spiritual part of us. The Greeks were totally into that. A lot of the Romans were... You, you see that in, in, in many Eastern religions. You see that in Buddhism, in, in Taoism, in uh, pantheism, panentheism. You see this in the cults. In, in New Age movements. The problem with this is ultimately it says you are God and you need to tap into the fact that you are God. And, and there's some pretty crazy stuff out there with people trying to free their inherent goddess or God, or God internal God, from the polluted physical world. And what these say is sin or evil isn't your fault, Evil is an environmental problem, both internally and externally. And you can overcome it through their program and through recreating your environment. The third solution or third worldview for why does evil exist is the biblical answer to evil. The biblical answer to evil and to suffering is not what, but who. Look, God personally entered 
the broken world, the world of broken man, by being the perfect man, Jesus Christ. And He conquered the eternal consequences of sin and in the end makes all things right. Romans 5 says that through Adam, through one man, all sin entered into the world for all men have sinned. See, this question of why does evil exist, actually for a Christian, it doesn't make an argument against Christianity. This makes an argument for Christianity. This is a question that encourages the biblical worldview because the Bible has the best answer and the best remedy for evil. Look, Christianity, and I want you to write this down. I have it on the screen. Christianity has the best definition of evil because it has the best definition of good. That makes sense? I hope that makes sense. And when we talk about what is good, we actually don't say what is good, we say who is good, and that is Christ. It's why Peter says we can give a defense of our faith. You look at the narrative, the story of human beings, creation, fall, redemption, and then, and then what awaits us is perfection in Christ, in heaven for eternity. All right, grab your Bible, go over to Genesis real quick. I want you to look at Genesis, please. I'm not going to have it on the screen. I want you to use your Bibles. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. When we look at the creation narrative, it's important to get this. Let's hop in at verse 3. God says, let there be light. Oh, and there was light. I love that verse because you know what's not yet in existence? The sun stars. In other words, if you, I love, I'm a kind of a science geek. love to talk about what light is. At the end, it talks about, in Revelation, how we don't need the sun, the stars, the other light, lesser lights, because Jesus will be the light in our midst. But it says there, God creates light. Verse 4, God saw that the light was good. And we see that idea continue through Scripture, through the creation narrative. I want you to look down chapter 1. I want you to look down at verse 31. And God saw everything that He had made. And behold, it was very good. So, God creates this, this, this good creation. God, create, God is good. So everything God creates would be good. Now, if we were to continue through this narrative, we see that God creates Adam, He creates Eve, and He gives them, and this is what's important now, He gives them this moral free will, this ability to choose to do right or to choose to do wrong, to do good or to do evil. C.S. Lewis has a great quote I have for you up here. It says, if a thing is free to be good, it is also free to be bad. And this is speaking here of the inherent human moral free will. It's very important to wrap our minds around that. If, if, if a man were to have the ability to do good, it must mean that he would have to have the ability to do that which is not good or evil, and he certainly does. So the big question is, I think, for most people, is, is I, a lot of people would agree with points one and two, but this third one now is what trips a lot of even Christians up, and that's this. Why then does God allow evil? Why does God allow evil? Because a lot of people get tripped up here and say that God causes evil. No. Or that God could prevent all evil. And yeah, he could. But the question is, why does God allow evil? And I will tell you this. One of the things, folks, that we should love about this book, the Bible is honest. The Bible is honest about the reality of pain, suffering, and evil, right? I, this is the most honest book ever written, friends. This is the most honest book ever written. It's honest about these things. That's why the, the, there's as many defeats of its people in this book as there is its victories. It's so clear about humans and human nature and pain and evil and suffering. We just saw this with Stephen. In Jeremiah chapter 12, I've got it on the screen. Look at this prophet. He says, Lord, you always give me justice when I bring a case before you. So let me bring you this complaint. Why are the wicked so prosperous? Great question, Jeremiah. Why are evil people so happy? He's speaking there, obviously, a little bit hyperbole, speaking 
as a, just a, a frustrated human being. You know, David would write in one of his psalms, how long must I struggle in my anguish, in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day? Why does God allow evil? It's a great question. I already mentioned C.S. Lewis, and, and I really enjoy C.S. Lewis's books and even his stories he's written, Narnia, all that stuff. But may, many people don't realize C.S. Lewis was actually an atheist during and at the end of World War I. C.S. could not wrap his mind around, and he just couldn't get over the fact that during World War I he had seen so much evil. And he said, there cannot be a God. There's too much evil on, all over this globe. He came out of it thinking, there can't be a God. There's too much evil in the world. But track with me here now. He says, it occurred to him, shortly after World War I, it occurred to him one day that his argument against God wasn't honest. Because to have a standard of good required something that was good itself. So he would write in his book called Mere Christianity, which everybody should read. He wrote, my argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? In other words, you wouldn't know that something was unjust unless you knew and unless you had a sense of what was just. And you do. So, so how would you have that apart from God? The very idea that we don't like evil is an, actually it's an argument for God. There would be no evil without good. And there would be no good if God did not exist. It's funny as atheists steal from God to argue against Him. Try to wrap your mind around this. They have to sit in God's lap to slap Him in the face. You know that? Objective evil presupposes objective good. And objective good requires moral absolutes. They have to assume God exists to make the case against Him. It's, really, it, it, it's fascinating when you understand that. To make the case against Him uh, because of evil. But they don't believe in God, and they don't have a moral standard to measure good with apart from God Himself. Here's what trips people up. I want you to understand this this morning. Here's, here's what trips people up. Okay, There is a God, yes? Yes, okay? He is good, yes? Yes. He is all-powerful. Yes? Yes. There is objective evil in this world. Yes? You know, I'm not, I'm not, you're like, are you tricking us yet? I'm not, I'm not tricking y'all. There is evil in the world. Yes? Yes, absolutely. So, here's what the postulate is then. Therefore, either God is not good or God is not all-powerful because of evil. That is pretty much, you go to any public university, unfortunately, ugh, even some Christian, uni Christian universities nowadays, and they will teach this idea. Well, either God's not good because he, he, evil exists, or, or and he created it, or God's not all-powerful because he could overcome it, but he doesn't. And, it's this, and that's a straw man argument. That's a total set-up argument there. Look, I want you to write this down. and I, this is, if, I, if I want you to get one thing this morning, it's this. Most people don't struggle with God's godness. What do they struggle with? God's goodness. You know, there, there's waves in culture and there's times where it's en, in vogue, it's cool to be an atheist. And then there's times it's cool to be religious. There's, it's interesting how as time goes on, there, there's cycles to this. And most people, when it comes to being honest intellectually, they know something can't come from nothing. They, they know that. They know that nothing can't create something. They understand the idea of purpose and causality. They understand when it comes to the arguments for God, 
There's a boatload. There's the cosmological arguments. There's the moral argument. There's the fine-tuning argument. There's DNA. There's consciousness itself. There's the, in, in the Bible, there's prophecy. There's archaeology. There's all these things. So I really feel like the case for the Creator is pretty airtight. And I also feel the case for the God, the Creator, that would be the God of the Old and New Testaments, that's pretty airtight as well. But, but to acknowledge that there is a God that has more authority than us, that's not something that a lot of people want. So what I have to do is then set up an argument against God to knock God off of His throne. So who can be? if I knock God off of His throne, who gets to sit on the throne? Me. And that's what the human heart wants in the first place. See, the human heart will say, oh God, you know, there can't be a God. It can't be this way. Because the human heart and mind will fight against a God that they don't understand. God is only good. His nature, His essence, His being, His mind, His heart is only good. And because He's that one, He's the one that gets to make the definition of good. And, and, and there's this dilemma. Okay, what is the answer to this dilemma of why does God allow evil? Here's what I want you to write down. For any evil that God allows, He has a morally justifiable and sufficient reason for it. For any evil God allows, He has a morally justifiable and sufficient reason for it. Here's the thing. Sometimes we get to see it, right? Oh, God, you're awesome. That's so cool. Love that. Sometimes we get to see it. Sometimes those after us, they get to see it. Basically, everybody after the close of the New Testament, what was recorded, most of them died for their faith. We live now in the aftermath of that, and we see the good, how, yes, Satan and, 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 and evil people tried to kill the early church and those involved. But what happened was it just it was a firestorm that lit and, and as we see at the end of Acts, they turned the world upside down. And sometimes when it comes to this, that reason, only God knows. At least on this side of eternity. The struggle with this is, and I, I, I would guess most believers understand this and believe it, the struggle is for that reason though, He doesn't have to tell us. That's where faith gets tough. We will frequently say when someone has done something we don't like, you owe me an explanation. You ever said that to somebody? You owe me an explanation? And we may not say that directly to God, but we sure feel it, and we sure think it. And I would say that's, sometimes that's understandable. Even we see that in Scripture. And, and when it comes to human relationships, horizontally, hey, you owe me an explanation, that may be one thing, but when it comes to the vertical, we can't, we can't force that. And God's even told us, hey, you've got to understand this about me. In Deuteronomy 29.29, 29, Deuteronomy 29, 29, it says the secret things belong to the Lord our God. Yes, there are things that are revealed. Well, that's for us. But the secret things belong to God. In Romans chapter 11, I want you to read a couple of verses here, Romans 11. It says, oh, the depth and riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable are His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord and, and who has been His counselor? Or who has given a gift to Him that He might be repaid? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things to Him be the glory forever. It's ironic when we hear people say, why won't God do something here? Why doesn't God intervene? Well, a lot of times if, if we say, God, why don't you get rid of evil? Well, maybe the reason God doesn't get rid of evil is maybe he'd start with me. Maybe he'd start with you. I mean, if God said tonight at midnight, 12 o'clock midnight, mountain standard time, I'm going to start eradicating evil from this planet. My wife would probably roll over at 12 o'clock in 10 seconds and I would be gone. Because he, he allows it on the planet to exist because people are on the planet. 
And that is the, uh, the, that's the counter of choosing to do good and to, and to do what is right is to do wrong. So we blame God for this when it's us. It's us. I want to give you a couple things here. I want you to think of this, okay? If God said to you, you know what, I'm going to give you the reins for a day. I'm going to give you the reins. I'm going to give you my power for a day. You'd be like, man, there are hundreds, if not thousands of things that I'm going to change. But track with me here now. But if God said, you know what, I'm also going to give you my heart and my wisdom, do you know what you'd change? Nothing. See, God can see the end from the beginning, and we don't. I want to give you just four kind of practical thoughts, four keys, if you will, to remember about living as a child of God in a world filled with evil. First thought is this. Though God abhors evil, look, y'all, this, 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 this brings us to our knees. He is still able to use it for His ultimate purpose and plan and good. If you've been coming to our church for any amount of time and you hear me preach, you know that we frequently, almost every week, we rarely have a sermon without mentioning the sovereignty of God. Why? Because God's sovereignty is our anchor. It's our anchor. Just knowing that there is a reason. Even if I don't know the reason, it's helpful, it's comforting. We see God really kind of, for a moment, open up the the, the curtain to show us how He works. At the end of Genesis 50, when everything's happened with Joseph and his brothers, Joseph says to his brothers in Genesis 50:20, "As for you, you guys, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring about to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are this day. And all of the evil that has happened, God in his eternal plan and purposes and goodness. He uses it for His ultimate will and His glory and even to our good. It's absolutely amazing. I want you to write down two words in your notes. I want you to write down ripple effect. Ripple effect. Everything that's occurring right now, right this very moment, it it ripples forward to affect, you understand, millions or billions of other actions and people. Almost everything right now that you are dealing with and experiencing today, that's in play because of the actions made yesterday, last week, last month, last year, last decade, and centuries ago. All the details of your life, okay? For you to exist, your parents had to meet. For them to exist, their parents had to meet. For them to exist, their parents had to meet. And you can see how this goes on and on. Details such as where you were born, when you were born, uh, your physical traits, your personality, all those types of things, right? Those were all the result of the ripples of other people's actions through history. So when it comes to even evil, every action is like that stone that's thrown in the lake. There's the ripples that come from it. We, evil can be thrown into the, into the pond, yes, But the ripples, God in His goodness, His sovereignty, in His awesomeness, takes those ripples and He makes them ultimately good. Like, if that doesn't bring you to your knees, there's pride in your heart because that's like, God, how do you do that? That's amazing. So though God abhors evil, He uses it for His good, for His ultimate plan. All right. Second thing, we are called to speak what is good in the face of evil. We are called as believers. As the, the ones who know good, we're called to stand against evil. And the thing is, I know Christians who get more upset about Christians pointing out evil than they do that evil itself. You may not think it is loving for me to get up here and say that abortion is evil. Right? You may not think I'm loving if I say, hey, any sexual activity outside of God's design of, design of one man and one woman in marriage is sinful. But I'm actually... If I, don't, if I withhold that truth, then I am evil. Does that make sense? Like that, that's why we speak the truth in love. And it applies to so, right? that, that biological gender that somebody was born with is what God intended for them. Things like that. We already read from Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20 about calling what is evil good and calling what is good evil. 
Look, if we call out evil, I want to say the counterbalance to this is, if we call out evil, we must also speak and do what is good and truthful and brings life and then live it out. We, we do the world no favors when we call out evil, but we are hypocrites ourselves, right? That's dangerous, and that, that's largely why the Christian worldview has lost a lot of its relevance in the world, is because we call out their evil while we allow it to exist in our own backyards. And that's not right. Uh, repentance and revival begins in our own backyard. So before we go out there and tell everybody else what's sinful and what's evil, uh, don't, don't go out there and tell everybody about the, the, the speck in their eye when you've got the log in your eye, like Jesus said. Right? Third point. I've got to move quick. We're almost done. Because evil exists, suffering well is a skill that Christians must learn. The world struggles with evil because they struggle with the results of evil. They struggle with suffering that comes from evil. Okay? We know there's a God who's in charge, who rules and reigns, who's good, and who's doing His will. So we should, as believers, we should suffer much better than the world who doesn't know God. Do you know somebody who suffers well? Aren't they, aren't they a testimony? Aren't they an encouragement? Sometimes we're in awe of them. Fourth thing I want to mention, and lastly here, is this. In the end, evil loses and is vanquished for eternity. Amen? Some of y'all aren't excited about that. In the end, evil loses. It's vanquished for eternity. Amen? All right, right? Death, where is your victory? Grave, where is your sting? We are already victorious. Sin and evil and hell have been defeated. And one day will fully be gone. Right? You say, well, wait, Pastor Chris. Here's a thought real quick. Is it possible that when we're in heaven, we just redo this all again? I got good news for you. No. Because when you get your new body, and when we are in heaven with Christ and have our completely full new nature, right? That sin nature is gone. That's gone. As a little kid, I used to wonder, like, man, what if we get to heaven and then I screw this whole thing up and we have to hit repeat? That would be awful. Good news, folks. It's gone for eternity. We're going to sing a closing song here in a minute. And then after that song, after we're finished with that, so worship team, go ahead and come on up. After that final song, uh, we're going to have a time of prayer. If you need prayer, please come on down front. If, you, if you're dealing with what we talked about this morning, the, the, the effects, the consequences of sin and evil, and you've got pain, you've got suffering, whatever, we will be down front here, and we would love to pray for you and encourage you. All right? Let's pray together. And after I pray, we will stand and we will sing out. Father, um, evil is hard for us. I mean, and it, it's such a, such a concept, sin and evil. Like, I could sit here and get so mad about it, but I know I sin. I know that I have hurt other people. Lord, I, and I'm sorry for that. I know that Christians have been the source of a lot of pain and suffering and even evil in this world and Forgive us for that, Lord. Help us to do better in walking our talk. Lord, I pray that through the power of your Spirit, we would not live in our own strength, but in yours, that we would be Christians who lovingly, courageously, boldly speak truth. And Lord, help us to never call good what is evil. Help us to never call evil that which you have said is good. Lord, we love you. We want to trust in your ways. I pray right now as we close uh, for people who might be struggling right now with evil. God, please give them victory. We pray this, Jesus, in your strong name. Amen.